Economics, known as the gloomy science, can provide valuable insights into the reasons behind low production rates, lengthy lead times, and cost overruns in defense procurement, particularly in shipbuilding. The second part of this article, refer to the link for part one, the gloomy science, will concentrate on the economic factors of production, including land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Each section will address the bottlenecks in warship production and suggest remedies to address the low shipbuilding levels. As stated in the first part of the paper, the U.S. has 12,000 miles, 19,000 kilometers, of coastline, so the land factor of economic production does not play a significant role in the shipbuilding issue. This review is still a summary, but it provides the reader with a segmentation from an economic perspective of the multi-causal issues to the shipbuilding dilemma and demonstrates the role of unintended consequences of incorrect policy or not addressing a known issue with enough foresight. Capital. Shipbuilding is capital intensive. It requires specialized equipment across multiple locations, and that includes the infrastructure to support such large capital production facilities as electrical power, water, transportation networks, and machine shops. The current U.S. production capacity for naval ships stagnates or slows down due to the neglect of updating and maintaining the aging infrastructure. The end of the Cold War played a significant role in this situation. The U.S. Navy planned to field a 600-ship Navy during the 1980s, which peaked at 594 ships in the 1987 to 1988 timeframe. The year 1991 marked the official end of the Cold War, resulting in a reduction in the Navy's need for 600 ships. The U.S. decided to prolong the life of the existing Los Angeles-class submarine, leading to the cancellation of 26 of the 29 planned Seawolf-class boats. This greatly reduced the pipeline of submarine production. Additionally, the Navy didn't require an infrastructure to sustain a 600-ship fleet, meaning it didn't replace retired ships due to age or wear with new ones. The War on Terror also impacted defense budgets, being less focused on big-ticket items such as warships, and more on maintaining troops in a war against insurgencies and non-peer adversaries. Given that most naval ships have a life expectancy of 25 to 50 years, the production infrastructure experienced significant excess capacity due to a lack of orders. As a result, many shipyards shuttered due to a lack of work, and those that stayed open suffered from a lack of infrastructure upgrades allowing them to fall into various levels of disrepair. When new shipyards did emerge, they scaled down due to a lack of orders that could support the construction of larger facilities. Additionally, the absence of orders resulted in manufacturers lacking the funds to maintain their existing facilities, as defense budgets were declining, and there were few opportunities to incorporate the costs of infrastructure and facilities into a defense contract. The post-Cold War consolidation of the defense industry resulted in the elimination of redundant services, thereby enhancing the cost-effectiveness and efficiency of the new corporation, albeit at the cost of sustaining excess production capacity to meet future needs. The U.S. Navy and Congress are considering the need to increase ship construction infrastructure. These new facilities will be built by the government and maintained under a government program, eliminating the need for defense manufacturers to take out loans or issue debt to create new facilities, which they would simply pass on to the U.S. government in the procurement contract. The U.S. government would then lease these facilities to a private company for their use, similar to how the U.S. Army manages the production of traditional ammunition like bullets and artillery rounds. This would incur additional government expenses in the future, but it would also resolve the issue of private companies needing to maintain facilities when future demand is uncertain. Labor. The same issue that allowed the capital factor of production to degrade also allowed the labor factor of production to degrade as well. Shipbuilding requires the intensive use of specialized labor from many different disciplines, and specialized labor is labor that has relatively high monetary costs attached to it. These fields are difficult to teach and take years to master. As the demand for building naval ships and capital resources declined due to inactivity or neglect, so did the need for labor. The reduction in naval orders resulted in the layoff of these skilled workers. The total capacity of U.S. shipbuilding is less than 1% of all world-produced tonnage, which meant that these skilled workers had no viable civilian sector jobs to apply their skills. As a result, many U.S. specialized shipbuilders either transitioned to other sectors of the economy or eventually retired. Since there is no significant civilian shipbuilding construction sector in the U.S., 
The Navy and its defense contractors are unable to substitute civilian ship manufacturers' laborers for those in the naval sector. It also means their relative cost of labor is higher as there are fewer of them in labor specialty that is relatively costly. The Navy and Congress are attempting to address the issue by offering training and incentive programs to attract labor to move to shipbuilding. This includes attracting experienced workers from other shipbuilding industries or related industries where the labor is at least partially transferable. While this may not directly address the experience gap, it could potentially alleviate some labor issues. Another option under consideration is a controversial proposal to increase legal immigration for foreigners who possess the necessary skill set and experience that U.S. shipyards currently lack. The political controversy surrounding increased legal immigration to fill jobs in the U.S. defense industry is a significant issue, but another concern is the security clearances of these workers. Defense work necessitates a range of security clearances, from minor criminal background checks to a U.S. government security clearance for handling sensitive technology. The safeguarding of American defense manufacturing techniques and technologies is a significant security concern. The AUKUS agreement encompasses a strict security framework, and U.S. shipbuilding plays a crucial role in achieving AUKUS Pillar 1. AUKUS Pillar 1 is the agreement that the U.S. and United Kingdom would provide nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. Foreign workers may need to be able to receive clearances that meet U.S. and AUKUS requirements to prevent espionage, entrepreneurship. The Navy and Congress are also exploring options to overcome some of the issues. This includes the exploration of using robotics in manufacturing, which would impact capital and labor. The implementation of robotics in the current warship manufacturing techniques remains uncertain. This can be avoided, and another entrepreneurial contribution is diversified manufacturing, where key components are made in smaller facilities and transported to the shipyard for warship assembly. Facilities not typically associated with shipbuilding could contribute to the construction of warships. Foreign outsourcing could also play a role in this, with the shipyard then shipping the assembled components back to the U.S. This option would have the same security concerns as using legal immigrants to work in defense manufacturing. Creating smaller warships like corvettes with highly specialized capabilities is another option. While these warships may be less capable than what the Navy currently deploys, they would provide an opportunity for smaller shipyards to enter the defense manufacturing industry. Autonomous warships, such as those proposed by the U.S. Navy in Project 33, can also be smaller in size. Unmanned warships don't need to be as large as manned ships because they don't require crew quarters and other components. A shrinking Navy and a shift in defense priorities away from confronting a peer or near-peer adversary have severely limited the ship manufacturing industrial base's production capacity over decades. The available defense capacity has become more expensive than in the past due to an increase in labor rates and the maintenance costs of old infrastructure. This is due to neglect and not having a manufacturing base that demands the specialized skills that are required for shipbuilding. To address the capacity issue and rising costs, we need to invest in infrastructure for necessary maintenance and new facilities, as well as train a workforce to handle it. The other option is for the U.S. to purchase warships from foreign countries, a move that would be politically unpopular and potentially violate many U.S. laws regarding defense spending. The fact is, it will take time for the U.S. to significantly increase its production capacity, and it will lag behind China for the foreseeable future.